Good morning, guys. Welcome to our weekly reading of My Side of the Mountain. We're going to read page 107 through 120. I'm going to try to go as fast as I can. Um, I hope we'll finish this book by the uh, end of the year. We might have to do two readings next week and then uh, one reading or two readings the following week and, and replace some assignments so we can finish this book. All right, page 107, in which trouble began. I stood at my doorway, the 23rd of November, dressed from head to toe in deer skins. As lined with rabbit fur, I had mittens and squirrel lined moccasins. I was quite excited by my wardrobe. I whistled and frightful came to my fist. She eyed me with her silky black eyes and pecked at my suit. Frightful, I said, this is not food. It is my new suit. Please don't eat it. She peeped softly, fluffed her feathers, and looked gently towards the meadow. You are beautiful too, Frightful, I said, and I touched her slight gray feathers on her back. Very gently, I stroked the jet black ones that came, uh, that came down from her eyes. Those beautiful marks gave her much of her superb dignity. In a sense, she had also come into a new suit. Her plumage had changed during the autumn, and she was breathtaking. And uh, again, so Frightful's getting older. Uh, the, the falcons actually have really nice plumage. Plumage is the feathers. That's a fancy word for uh, bird feathers. And so this is what Frightful is starting to look like now, uh, a really beautiful bird. I walked to the spring and we looked in it. I saw us quite clearly as there are no longer any frogs to plop in the water and break the mirror with circles and ripples. Frightful, I said, as I turned and twisted and looked. It would be quite handsome if it were not for my hair. I need another haircut. I did the best job I was able to do with a pen knife. I had, I made a mental note to make a hat to cover the straw ends. Then I did something which took me by surprise. I smelled the clean air of November, turned once more to see how the back of my suit looked, and walked down the mountain. I stepped over the stream on the stones. I walked to the road. Before I could talk myself out of it, I was on my way to town. As I walked down the road, I kept pretending I was going to the library, but it was Sunday, and I knew the library was closed. Tethered frightful just outside town on a stump. I didn't want to attract any attention. Kicking stones as I went and whistling, I walked to the main intersection of town as if I came every Sunday. I saw the drugstore and began to walk faster, for I was beginning to sense that I was not exactly what everybody saw every day. Eyes were upon me longer than they needed to be. By the time I got to the drugstore, I was running. I slipped in and went to the magazine stand, picked up a comic book, and began to read. Footsteps came towards me. Below the bottom picture, I saw a pair of pants and saddle shoes. One shoe went tap, tap, tap. The feet did a kind of hop step, and I watched them walk to the other side of me. Tap, tap, tap. Again, a hop step, and the shoes and pants circled me. Then came the voice. Well, if it isn't Daniel Boone. And uh, Daniel Boone is uh, a folk hero. This is the real picture of Daniel Boone. This is a picture of uh, Daniel Boone from movies. And so he was alive in 1734, and he died in 1820. And he was kind of the first uh, folk hero. And people would make up stories about him, and he was really known for hunting and fighting uh, Native Americans and stuff. Uh, and oh yeah, and he was known for wearing leather too, which uh, Sam is known for wearing leather, and you can kind of see it in both these pictures. So that's why the boy called him Daniel Boone. I looked into a face about the age of my own, but a little more puppyish, I thought. I had about the same coloring, brown eyes, brown hair, a bigger nose than mine, and more ears, but a very assured face, I said. Well, I grinned, because it had been a long time since I had seen a young man my age. The young man didn't answer. He simply took my sleeve between his fingers and examined it closely. Did you chew it yourself, he asked. I looked at the spot he was examining and said, well, no, I pounded it on a rock there, but I did have to chew it a bit around the neck. It stuck me. We looked at each other then. I wanted to say something, but I didn't know where to begin. I picked up my sleeve again. 
My kid brother has one that looks more real than that thing. What do you got that on for anyway? I looked at his clothes. He had on a nice pair of gray slacks, a white shirt, opened at the neck, and a leather jacket. As I looked at these things, I found my voice. Well, I'd rip anything like you have on all the pieces in about a week. He didn't answer. He walked around me again. Where did you say you came from? I didn't say, but I come from a farm up the way. What'd you say your name was? Well, you called me Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone, eh? He walked around me once more and then peered at me. You're from New York. I can tell the accent. And uh, people from New York have a very distinct accent. So if you guys uh, ever hear people from New York, you can uh, tell once you know their accent that they are from New York. He leaned against the cosmetic counter. Come on now, tell me. Is this what the kids are wearing in New York now? Is this gang stuff? I'm hardly a member of a gang, I said. Are you? Out here? Nah, we bowl. The conversation went to bowling for a while. Then he looked at his watch. I gotta go. You sure are a sight, Boone. What you doing anyways, playing cowboys and Indians? Come up to the Gribbly farm and I'll show you what I'm doing. I'm doing research. Who knows when we're all gonna be blown to bits and need to know how to make smoked venison. Gee, you New York guys, and sure double talk. What does that mean? Burn a block down? No, I mean smoked venison, I said. Took a piece out of my pocket and gave it to him. He smelled it and handed it back. Man, he said, what do you do, eat it? I sure do, I answered. I don't know whether to send you home, play with my kid brother, or call the cops. He shrugged his shoulders and repeated that he had to go. As he left, he called back. The Gribbling Farm? Yes, come on up if you can find it. I browsed through the magazines until the clerk got anxious to sell me something. Then I wandered out. Most of the people were in church. I wandered around the town and back to the road. It's nice to see people again. At the outskirts of town, a little boy came bursting out of the house with his shoes off, and his mother came bursting out after him. I caught the little fellow by the arm, and I held him until his mother picked him up and took him back. She went up the steps. She st stopped and looked at me. She stepped towards the door and then walked about a few steps and looked at me again. I began to feel conspicuous and took the road to my mountain. I passed the little old strawberry lady's house. I almost went in and then something told me to go home. I found Frightful, untied her, stroked her creamy breast feathers and spoke to her. Frightful, I made a friend today. Do you think that is what I had in mind all the time? The bird whispered. I was feeling sad as we kicked up the leaves and started home through the forest. On the other hand, I was glad I had met Mr. Jacket, as I called him. I never asked his name. I'd liked him, although we hadn't had a fight. All the best friends I had, I always fought. Then we got to like them after the, the wounds healed. The afternoon darkened and nut aches that had been clinking around the trees were silent. The chickadees had vanished single crow called from the edge of the road. There were no insects singing. There were no catbirds or orioles or varios or robins. Frightful, I said, it is winter. It is winter and I have forgotten to do a terribly important thing. Stack up a big wood pile. The stupidity of this sent Mr. Jacket right out of my mind and I bolted down the valley to my mountain. Frightful flapped to keep her balance as I crossed the stones to my mountain trail. I said to that bird, sometimes I wonder if I will make it to spring, in which I pile up wood and go on with winter. Now I am almost to the snowstorm. The morning after I had the awful thought about the wood, I got up early. I was glad to hear the nut aches and chickadees. They gave me the feeling that I still had time to chop. They were bright busy and totally unworried about storms. I shouldered my axe and went to work. I had used most of the wood around the hemlock house, so I crossed to the top of the gorge. First, I took all the dry limbs off the trees and hauled them home. Then I chopped down dead trees. With wood all around me, I got in my tree and put my arm out. I made necks in the needles. Where the X lay, I began stacking wood. I wanted to be able to reach my wood from the trees when the snow was deep. Piled a big stack at the point 
I reached out the other side of the door and made another X. I piled wood here. Then I stepped around my piles and had a fine idea. I decided that if I used up one pile, I could tunnel through the snow to the next and the next. I made many wood piles leading out into the forest. I watched the sky. It was blue summer, but ice was building along the waterfall at the gorge. And I put a picture of this uh, waterfall here. So uh, it's starting to get cold and snowy and the ice is starting to pile along the edge here from the mist of the waterfall. I knew winter was coming, although each day the sun would rise in a bright sky and the days would fall cloudless. I piled more wood. This was when I realized that I was scared. I kept cutting wood and piling it like a nervous child biting his nails. It was almost with relief that I saw the storm arrive. Now I am back where I began. I won't tell it again. I shall go on now with my relief and the fun and wonderness, wonderfulness of living on the mountaintop in the winter. The barren weasel loved the snow and was up and about in it every day. Rifle and I had our breakfast. Professor Bando's jam was my standby on those cold mornings. I'd eat mounds of it on my hard acorn pancakes which I improved by adding hickory nuts. With these as a bracer for the day, Frightful and I would stamp out into the snow and reel down the mountain. She would fly above my head as I slid and plunged and rolled through the creek. The creek was frozen. I would slide down onto it and break a little hole in ice fish. The sun would glance off the white snow, the birds would fly through the trees, and I would come home with fresh meal from the valley. I found there were still plants under the snow, and I'd dig down to get tea berry leaves and wintergreen. I got this idea from the deer who found a lot to eat under the snow. I tried some of the mosses that they liked, but decided moss was for the deer. Around four o'clock, we would all wander home. The nut eggs, the chickadees, the cardinals, frightful, and me. And now came the nicest part of wonderful days. I would stop in the meadow and throw a frightful off my fist. Should wind in the sky and wait above me as I kick the snow bent grasses. A rabbit would pop up, or sometimes a pheasant. Out of the sky, from a pinpoint of a thing, would dive my beautiful falcon. And oh, she was beautiful when she made a strike, all power and beauty. On the ground, she would cover her quarry. Her perfect feathers would stand up on her body, and her wings would arch over the food. She never touched it until I came and picked her up. I'd go home and feed her and crawl into my tree room, light a little fire on my hearth, and Frightful and I would begin the winter evening. I had lots of time to cook and try mixing different plants with different meats to make things taste better. And I must say, I originated some excellent meals. When dinner was done, the fire would blaze on. Frightful would sit on the foot post of the bed and preen and wipe her beak and shake. Just the fact that she was alive with a warming thing to know. I'd look at her and wonder what made a bird a bird and a boy a boy. The forest would become silent. I'd know that the barren weasel was about, but I would not hear him. Then I'd get a piece of birch bark and write, or I'd make new things out of deer hide, like a hood for frightful. And finally, I'd take off my suit and my moccasins and crawl into my bed under the sweet smelling deer skin. The fire would burn itself out and I would fall, would be asleep. Those were nights of the very best sort. One night I read some of my old notes about how to pile wood so I could get to it under the snow. And I laughed until Frightful awoke. I hadn't made a single tunnel. I walked on the snow to get wood like the barren weasel went for food or the deer went for moss. 116, in which I learn about birds and people. Frightful and I settled down to living in snow. We went to bed early, slept late, ate the mountain harvest, and explored the country alone. Oh, the deer walked with us, the foxes followed in our footsteps, the winter birds flew over our heads, but mostly we were alone in the white wilderness. It was nice. It was very, very nice. My deerskin rabbit line suit was so warm that even when my breath froze in my nostrils, my body was snug and comfortable. Frightful fluffed on the coldest days, but a good flight into the air around the mountain would warm her, and she would come back to my fist with a thump and a flip. This was her signal of good spirits. 
<clears throat> I did not become lonely. Many times during the summer, I had thought of the long winter months ahead with some fear. I'd read so much about the loneliness of the farmer, the trapper, the woodsman during the bleakness of winter that I'd come to believe it. The winter was as exciting as the summer, maybe more so. The birds were magnificent and almost tame. They talked to each other, warned each other, fought for food, for kinship, and for the right to make the most noise. Sometimes I'd sit in my doorway, which became an entrance to behold, a portico of pure white snow adorned with snowman, and watch them with endless interest. They reminded me of Third Avenue, and I gave them the names that seemed to fit. And uh, this part was kind of uh, confusing. He starts to talk about these chickadees and uh, talks about them like they were people that were uh, living with him in the city. There was Mr. Brackett. He lived on the first floor of our apartment house and no one could sit on his step or even make a noise near his door without being chased. Mr. Brackett, the chickadee, spent most of his time chasing the young chickadees through the woods. Only his mate could share his favorite perches and feeding places. Then there was Mrs. O'Brien, Mrs. Calloway, and Mrs. Ferdorio. On 3rd Avenue, they would all go off to the market together first thing in the morning, talking and pushing and stopping to lecture to children in gutters and streets. Mrs. Ferdorio always followed Mrs. O'Brien, and Mrs. O'Brien always followed Mrs. Calloway, and talking and pushing and even in buying an apple. And there they were again in my hemlock, three busy chickadees. They would flit and rush around and click and fly, from one eating spot to another. They were noisy, scolding, and busily following each other. All the other chickadees followed them, and they made way only for Mr. Brackett. The chickadees, like the people on Third Avenue, had their favorite routes to and from the best food supplies. They each had their own resting perches, and each had a little shelter in a tree cavity to which they would fly when the day was over. They would chatter and call good night and make a big fuss before they parted and then the forest would be as quiet as the apartment house on third avenue when all the kids were off the street and all the parents had said their last words to each other and everyone had gone to their own little holes sometimes when the wind howled and the snows blew the chickadees would be out for only a few hours even mr brackett who had been elected by the chickadees to test whether or not it was too stormy for good hunting would appear for a few hours and disappear some uh, disappear. Sometimes I would find him just sitting quietly on a limb next to the bole of a tree, all fluffed up and doing nothing. There was no one who more enjoyed doing nothing on a bad day than Mr. Brackett of Third Avenue. Frightful, the two Mr. Brackets and I shared this feeling. When the ice and sleet and snow drove down through the hemlocks, we all pulled up. I looked at my calendar poll one day and realized that it was almost Christmas. Vandal will come, I thought. I'll have to prepare a feast and make a present for him. Took stock of the frozen venison and decided that there was enough steaks for us to eat nothing but venison for a month. Scooped under the snow for tea berry plants to boil down to pour over snowballs for dessert. I checked my cache of wild onions to see if I had enough to make onion soup. And set aside some large firm ground nuts for mashed potatoes. There were still piles of dog tooth violet bulbs and Solomon, Solomon seal root and a few dried apples. I cracked walnuts, hickory nuts, and beech nuts, then began, began a pair of deer hide moccasins lined with rabbit fur for Vando's present. I finished them bef these before Christmas, so I started a hat of the same material. Two days before Christmas, I began to wonder if Vando would come. He had forgotten, I was sure of, or he was busy, I said, or he thought I was no longer here and decided not to tramp on through the snow to find out. On Christmas Eve, Bando still had not arrived, and I began to plan for a very small Christmas was frightful. About 4.30 Christmas Eve, I hung a small red cluster of tea berries on the deerskin door. I went in my tree room for a snack of beech nuts when I heard a faint, hello. And these are those tea, uh, tea berries. So 
So people make like garlands out of them for um, Christmas. They got these little red berries uh, that are really pretty and uh, they don't dry out quite as fast as like normal leaves so they can stay up kind of like a wreath. Hello from far down the mountain. I snuffed out my tallow candle, jumped into my coat and moccasins and plunged out in the snow. Again, a hello floated over the quiet snow. I took the bearing on the sound and bounced down the hill to meet Bando. I ran into him just as he turned up the valley to follow the stream bed. I was so glad to see him that I hugged him and pounded him on the back. Never thought I'd make it, he said. I walked all the way from the entrance of the state park. Pretty good, eh? He smiled and slapped his tired legs. Then he grabbed my arms and with three quick pinches, tested the meat on me. You've been living well, he said. You look closely at my face, but you're gonna need a shave in a year or two. I thanked him and we sprang up the mountain, out across, through the gorge and home. I was the frightful, he asked, as soon as we were inside and the light was lit. I whistled, she jumped to my fist. He got bold and stroked her. In the jam, he asked, excellent, except the crooks are absorbent and are sopping up all the juice. Or well, I brought you some more sugar, we'll try next year. Merry Christmas. The row, he shouted and looked about the room. I see you've been busy. A blanket, new clothes, and an ingenious fireplace with a real chimney. And say, you have silverware. Picked up the forks I had carved. We ate smoked fish for dinner with boiled dog tooth violet bulbs. Walnuts dipped in jam were dessert. Bando was pleased with his jam. When we were done, Bando stretched out on my bed, propped his feet up, and lit his pipe. And now I have something to show you, he said. He reached in his coat pocket and took out a newspaper clipping. It was from New York. It was from a New York paper, and it read, Wild boy suspected living off deer and nuts in wilderness of Catskill. And we're going to stop there for the week. Uh, down right there at the bottom of 120. Make sure that you guys take that quiz. Make sure you hit submit after you take it, and I'll see you guys at our Zoom meeting.